Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Babbitts. I teach at Harvard Law School. I'm a lawyer. I question the digital initiative's wisdom in having a lawyer back clean up at the end of this amazing day, but I, I defer to them on that. So um, bear with me. Hope, hopefully this will be uh, uh, interesting. I'm here to talk about um, an initiative we have going on at the research center where I'm based, the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And there are a bunch of Berkman Klein folks in the room today, so please um, uh, speak to them if you're more interested in uh, uh, the work that we do. Um, talking about uh, a, a big research initiative we have going on, a collaboration between Berkman and the MIT Media Lab, looking at the ethics and governance of artificial intelligence. So a very narrow, small problem that I can address in 10 minutes and that we'll figure out in the next hour. Um, we'll get this all sorted out. Um, so what exactly does this mean? We're going to talk today less about sort of AI technology and algorithmic technologies and more about, and where my role comes in as a lawyer, thinking about how do we incentivize the creation, the development, the procurement, the use of these technologies in ways that are fair and just and equitable and in ways that minimize their tendency for bias and for um, other things that we see coming out of these kinds of technologies. Um, a little bit of level setting with apologies to folks like James and Margot who will know this stuff uh, better than uh, anyone in the room for the really shortcut way of doing this. When we talk about uh, ethics and governance of artificial intelligence, we're using AI in the loosest sense of the word really to cover a bunch of different buckets of technology. So technologies that are algorithmic, our algorithms are just sets of uh, instructions, rules for, for people to follow. Key, I think, is that they are oftentimes rules that are opaque, that are not very transparent to the person who is being impacted by the application of those rules. Um, uh, I'm going to test the limits of the notion of relevant XKCD. For those of you who are fans of the XKCD comic strip, by using a few of those today. If you, um, to just say that uh, 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 algorithms are not brand new things. They are not new themselves new ways of solving problems. They are sets of instructions. And so if you come in thinking you're going to solve a difficult problem using an algorithm, again, you're simply imposing more rules. And uh, it is not necessarily a solution in and of itself. It's a means of approaching um, a problem. Machine learning technology, again, part of this bucket, which again covers, it covers a lot of ground. Machine learning extracts patterns from unlabeled data. Um, we feed information to uh, a machine learning technology, and it draws uh, conclusions, not necessarily causal co connections, which is interesting, but draws um, uh, conclusions from data sets by finding uh, connections. This example, if you want a, a, a computer to know how to uh, cross uh, the road, you could explain it how to cross the road, or you could show it um, 10,000 videos of people crossing the road and 10,000 videos of people crossing the road and getting hit by cars, and have the computer sort out what's involved in making a decision whether to cross the street. Um, some examples of things that machine learning can do. Um, uh, you can uh, feed it picture data and it can do image recognition. You can feed it application data for loans and financial instruments along with data about the outcomes of those uh, loans and have it draw conclusions about eligibility of different people for loans, that sort of thing. Um, so that's machine learning. And the last bit is sort of true artificial intelligence, which actually for the stuff that we're working on is probably oddly the least relevant, even though it's in the title of the initiative. Uh, artificial intelligence can be broadly understood as a characteristic or set of capabilities exhibited by a computer that resembles intelligent behavior. A lot of things that we see called AI out there in the world are not AI at all. They're algorithmic. They maybe involve some machine learning, some, data, some training of, of tools on, on uh, big data sets, but don't exactly um, exhibit um, what I would think of as sort of true artificial intelligence. So what are the legal implications of these technologies and really what's new about them? Do we have, you know, is, is it worth actually dedicating a lot of time and energy to think about regulatory models and involving the companies that develop them in ways that can't be addressed by uh, ways we've, we've done this in the past, looking at, for example, the development of the internet, previous development of telecommunications technologies. Again, I'll go back to XKCD. Um, one set of rules that we have out there that will, Im that will impact the ability of people to use these technologies maliciously are things like rules against murder, right? That applies with respect to artificially intelligent technologies just as it applies to other forms of technology. So um, again, if you're concerned about certain kinds of malice that one might cause using uh, the technologies we're looking at, you can look at a baseline set of rules and laws that we have that govern our behavior more generally. You don't need anything specific uh, in that case. I do think there are a number of things about these technologies that are interesting and that lend themselves to uh, suggest that they are uh, amenable to sort of new and um, 
uh, new development of models of governance and uh, regulation. One is obviously autonomy. Some of these tools operate in ways that do not require a human actor or that minimize the involvement of a human actor at the moment where you're utilizing the technology. Obviously, all of these technologies involve humans in their creation, but um, true AI uh, is going to involve a level of autonomy that is, I think, different from a lot of technologies we've employed in the past, and that, I think, lends itself to some new ways of approaching governments. Ubiquity and uh, pervasiveness, these things are everywhere. They are, we're talking about alg you know, algorithms and, and uh, machine learning uh, technologies that drive self-driving cars, but we're also talking about algorithms that deliver us our news every day, right? So the fact that they uh, exist in everything that we do, I think, separates them from certain technologies that we've seen in the past. Um, complexity, uh, really interesting problems about having public debates, particularly as we get into some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about in a second, where I think it's really important that we draw the public into conversations about whether and where we want these technologies deployed. The technical complexity of them presents some um, challenges. And I mentioned earlier the opacity, the fact that we don't always have a sense that one of these technologies is working at all. Uh, that is involved at all in a decision that we're, um, that we're, we're uh, affects us. Um, and if we do have a sense uh, that there's uh, an algorithm or, or, or machine learning behind something that we're doing, we have no real concept of how it works and how it's helping to make decisions. And lastly, interpretability, the, the, the difficulties associated with having a particular decision made with the assistance of technology explained to us. Interpretability, explainability is really important for lawyers. Um, we're going to talk in, in a little bit about um, some examples of uses of, of algorithmic tools in the criminal justice system. When we render criminal punishments uh, and, and when we uh, prescribe sentences or make decisions about bail, we typically expect for due process reasons a lot of explanation about that. We want to understand and interpret why a judge does what she does, and these technologies don't always lend themselves to that. Um, so the swath of this initiative that I work, mostly work on is this what we call algorithms and justice, and, and that's really looking at the deployment of these kinds of tools by government. Um, and the, the primary example, which I just alluded to, that is getting a lot of attention these days is these algorithmic tools that are used uh, in bail sentencing and parole decisions. This is mostly in the context of bail and, and um, got a lot of attention. ProPublica did some work um, uh, a couple of years ago, Julia Angwin, looking at a data set relating to a particular tool that's in use in a lot of courts around the country and um, determining that um, there are some uh, uh, biases uh, inherent in the use of these tools that suggest that similarly situated people of different races may be treated differently by these tools. This work has been uh, uh, the subject of a lot of discussion, a lot of critique, but again, it, 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 it reveals um, what I think we all understand, which is that if you simply use, uh, feed a bunch of data to a machine learning uh, algorithm and have it draw conclusions, you're, uh, and if that data is biased as, shocker, criminal justice data is, um, you're going to end up with some biased outcomes. It should not surprise us. So the algorithms and justice track, the work that we're doing is looking specifically at the use of these technologies when they're deployed by government, the, the risk scoring um, thing being, being one, uh, one small piece of that. I'll talk really briefly about our research approach, which has been to look at these four um, uh, uh, sort of uh, steps in the process of developing one of these technologies, procurement by a, usually by a government actor of these technologies, deployment and use of these technologies, and then ultimately evaluating the impact of them. And uh, I'm not going to go through every step in our uh, full research schema other than to say that each of these steps when we're talking about a government actor raises particular sets of concerns. So the notion of deployment and use when a judge is sitting there with a risk score and using that score to do, uh, help assess bail for a particular defendant that is in front of the judge, that raises due process implications that which um, derive from our Constitution. Um, the development and procurement stage, I'll say procurement in particular, raises questions for state government procurement officers who are now being forced to make really, really complicated decisions about really, really complicated pieces of software when they are primarily charged with procuring software that doesn't have these very difficult and complex legal and ethical issues behind them. If you're asking the same person who is charged with procuring Microsoft Office for the work computers to also procure a risk assessment score for the criminal justice system, there are very different considerations that have to go and to be taken into account when you're making those kinds of decisions. Monetary and efficiency, obviously, but also ethical and legal and, 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 and the rest of that. Um, really quick note on some things that have been going on in Massachusetts on this front. Uh, last year, we had a very significant criminal justice reform effort in Massachusetts, which led to two separate bills, a House bill and a Senate bill. And the Senate bill, interestingly, uh, Senate Bill 2185 last fall said that 
uh, directed, had it been passed, that pretrial services, which is essentially the division of mass state government that runs bail, um, shall create or choose a risk assessment tool that analyzes risk factors to produce risk assessment classifications for defendants. And then the second sentence after that basically says, I will paraphrase, but be sure that it's not biased, which is a little bit more complicated than that, but it says any tool shall be tested and validated to identify and eliminate unintended economic race, gender, or other bias. Now there were some efforts to, um, to mitigate the impacts had this gone forward, and in fact the version of this bill that was just delivered to our governor this week actually does not include this language, which would be a mandate to adopt these tools in Massachusetts. Instead what we've done is we've said we're gonna have a year of study to kind of look, set up a commission and look at these things and decide, do they do what they're intended to do? And I, and I should be clear, there are, there are very good and noble intentions behind this, the idea of eliminating human biased decision makers from certain aspects of the process, or at least informing those decision makers with data is intended to promote consistency uh, from judge to judge and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, I think there's a, a world in which you could imagine certain versions of these tools um, actually doing some good. Um, but uh, we're gonna study that for a year um, here in Massachusetts. So if you come hang out with me for the next uh, hour or so, a few of the things I would love to talk to you about include, um, are the, again, this idea of are these issues new? Are there existing decision-making patterns that we can look at? Uh, existing rubrics for multi-stakeholder initiatives, standard setting solutions, other kinds of things that we think could help us promote innovation, ensure that companies, private and public actors are utilizing technology to the max and, and, and uh, innovating and, and actually trying to uh, uh, mitigate bias wherever it happens. Um, what are the appropriate levers for regulating these kinds of technologies? Again, I'm a lawyer, uh, I'm a hammer, my nail is the law. You would think I would say, well, let's pass lots of laws, but it seems to me this is the kind of project that, uh, these are the kinds of tools that lend themselves to really interdisciplinary solutions of the sort we love to pursue at the Berkman Klein Center where we would have computer scientists and lawyers and ethicists and philosophers, and I was just talking to somebody at the Harvard Divinity School this week about this stuff, and I think they need to be at the table too um, to kind of help us think through the solutions to these problems. How do we correlate these legal versus uh, technical uh, concepts like interpretability and explainability, which have very different meanings when you have a lawyer versus a computer scientist answer them? How do we engage with lawmakers? And then the last one, I think we really need to be thinking about how to have a public conversation about this stuff. This is really, uh, again, dense, complicated, technical stuff that has incredibly wide impact impact and I think it's vitally important that we have the public at the table um, and does that mean that they are getting under the hood of the technology? Is there one level up at which we can have these conversations? So, um, and again, I'm sure we can resolve that in the next hour. So really, yeah, so um, thanks everybody, appreciate it.